Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I, my name is Louisa and I make video content and teachings about mental health, spirituality and healing. Today, I want to talk to you about healing in general, the healing path. And this could be for physical health issues, for mental health issues, for anything really that's causing you pain. And I've been inspired, I suppose, by my own journey, as most of my material is inspired by my lived experience. And that journey at the moment for the last couple of months has been about healing uh, my hip. So I had a hip injury about uh, early 20s. I fell off a horse and uh, I couldn't walk, walk for two weeks. But, you know, as you do when you're in your 20s, you kind of don't get it seen to or checked out. Um, so I probably did quite a bit of damage then and I didn't even realize it. So fast forward age 36, um, I was a competitive kickboxer. I'd been doing martial arts for years and kickboxing for years and probably a good 10 years all up, which is a lot of wear and tear on the hip, a lot of pressure on the hip. And um, yeah, I had another injury in kickboxing. And at that time I got uh, surgery, x-rays and confirmation from a surgeon that um my hip wasn't sitting properly in the socket and it was basically hip dysplasia and it was causing cartilage loss and pain. He recommended that I have some very dramatic surgery to basically saw my pelvis in half, move the hip, the pelvis over the hip joint and um, that would align everything and then I would be healthy. But he said there was a 40% chance I was going to lose feeling in my leg, at which point I went, no, thanks. I'm going to go do some yoga and natural therapies at which point I'm pretty sure he rolled his eyes and thought to himself, well, I'll see her in 20 years, you know, kind of thing when she's in lots of pain. Um, so <laughs> fast forward now to right now, this year, um, the pain's come back and pretty badly. Like I actually couldn't walk very well at all um, and was having to massively limit activities. Even just getting around the house was painful. And um yeah, I mean, what do you do when you're in a situation like that, right? A healing crisis. And um, I did, you know, really go through a bit of mental torment in the first few weeks of envisioning that horrible timeline that that surgeon had given me about, um, you know, I've got a degenerate bone disease, it's arthritis, it's hip dysplasia, it can never be healed. I'm probably going to need a hip replacement. And I probably should have attended to this years ago. So there was like layers of guilt and fear. Guilt and fear were the biggest things. Um, but fortunately, I have, you know, so much guidance now. I'm so open to my, my higher self-guidance and also faith in natural healing, faith in the body's ability to heal, that I was able to kind of, while well, simultaneously listening to that timeline or that narrative in my own mind and hearing those parts of me that was so terrified of being powerless, having to give over my power to a system, having to potentially not walk again, having to give up things I loved, like all of that was wrapped up in that narrative. I could hear it, feel it, acknowledge it, accept it and love it. And on the other side, there was this, other narrative which you know if I hadn't focused on it could have kind of lost its power right what we focus on is what we give our power to and that narrative was telling me that if I just looked for the right remedies and paid attention and took care of this I might find a way out of this I believed and I still do I believe that we can heal ourselves Belief is a very important component to what I'm about to talk about. Um, and maybe that belief for me comes from having gone through the diagnosis for schizophrenia and deep down always believing that I could recover from that, despite what people told me and what textbooks told me. And despite often the terrible dark times I found myself in, which you know, I was tempted to visualize that negative timeline for myself but I kept believing and, and I had people around me that also supported me and step by step by step I got better and it took a few years many years really but here I am today so having had that embodied experience I've actually gone through it I have now the faith that I can do this but I've never really done it 
to a great degree anyway with my physical body. And I realized that there was a block there around believing whether my physical body can actually be healed simply by my consciousness, right? And I've realized um, with that approach, using your consciousness to heal yourself, it's not enough to just sit there and meditate and manifest and will it in and, you know, all of that work we do when we kind of set our intentions. We do need that stuff. It is super important. You've got to know where you want to go. You've got to be activating the I want component of your of yourself, right? And I point right here to the forehead because it's like the prefrontal cortex where we make decisions. I want this. I want to be well. And I also feel it comes from the solar plexus too, which is the chakra of the desire, the I want, the will, the power, the personal power, the ego power, right? I, Louisa, I want to be healed. That's wonderful. I can sit in meditation and really get into that and feel it. But this is the second part. You must act, right? It's not just going to fall down from the sky and land in your lap. Universe, spirit, God, creator, source wants to meet us halfway, wants us maybe even less than halfway. He just wants us to walk, start walking over that bridge. Start walking towards your goals. And walking is the verb I'm using here for action. So you've got to do, and this is where, you know, I, I started to do some, some research because what am I going to do? How does one cure this? How do I cure hip arthritis? Um, and, you know, soon enough, thank you to our beautiful internet, the world of alternative remedy for hip arthritis opened up to me. And very soon, within about a week or two, I had a program mapped out for myself, which you know, I it's the details of it is not so important for this video because I'm trying to speak to any physical ailment that you've got, any mental health issue you've got. Um, the remedies are not going to be the same for everybody. I was using my intuition, being guided as to what I needed. And what I found in a nutshell, just so you've got a kind of practical example, was a physio program that is just super beneficial for me. It's um a very uh, dedicated and clearly laid out and logical physio program um, and online, but also with access to actual real life people, recovery coaches that can talk me through difficult times or help me answer my questions. Um, and that program requires, it's quite uh, intense hourly exercises, right? Hourly exercises and strengthening of certain muscles and that kind of thing. Plus, walking around on a cane, which I'm, you know, initially I was like, oh, cane, like I'm not old enough to have a cane. But, you know, I just set all that aside and got myself a cane. <laughs> and it's been fantastic because I've offloaded the pressure on my hip. I'm giving it time to heal, right? So that's one component is the physio, but the other component was diet. And this is I would say this component is true for anything, no matter what you're suffering from. If it's cancer, if it's diabetes, if it's arthritis, if it's depression, if it's schizophrenia, you need to drink water, lots and lots and lots and lots of water. I really hadn't appreciated how dehydrated I was until I started this because along with my physio, I found my way to another beautiful teacher called Barbara O'Neill, and I'll put a link to some of her material down below. Um, and again, I'm not saying she's your fit, she's perfect for you, but she was perfect for me. And she explains the acid alkalinity balance in the body, particularly when you're when you're trying to recover from any kind of inflammation, which arthritis is an inflammation. So um, going on an acid alkaline diet and drinking about two and a half to three liters of water a day. So I reckon I was probably drinking about a liter of water a day. And I'm a fairly healthy person, but I wasn't nearly hydrated enough. So now that I'm drinking so much water, I've noticed tons of little minor changes that have been very, very positive, including being able to finally sleep well when my head hits the pillow. And I have suffered from, it's not full-blown insomnia now, it used to be, but I haven't suffered from inability to get to sleep for years. 
And I've been using some medications for that sometimes, some Valium if I need to, some CBD oil. I've tried grounding sheets for my mattress, like all sorts of things. Um, lack of screen time, herbal teas, you name it. Water. Amazing, amazing side effect of something that I was doing for my hip. But ever since I've been drinking the water, I've been getting to sleep within 10, 20 minutes. So that, well, even less, 10 minutes. That's so good for me. I'm so excited. Right. So that's a bonus. Anyway, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent there. I'm not here to tell you how to heal. I'm just using this to illustrate that I found some key things that I needed. Hydration, diet, physio. And this is really the point I want to make now. I've been doing this now for 23 days. How do I know that? Because I'm keeping a journal. Okay. Journal is going to be your absolute best friend when you're recovering from something acute. The reason you want to keep a journal is, and I don't necessarily mean a, you know, a, a full-on prose, poetic, this is what I did today, this is how I'm feeling. I That would be wonderful to journal as well. Um, in fact, if you're recovering from a mental health crisis, recording your emotional ups and downs is also very, very important. Um, but it can be as basic as this, right? I'm just like every day I'm just recording uh, the date, <laughs> my pH of my my urine because I have to do an acid alkaline test every morning, what I've eaten, whether I did my exercises um, and what I did that day, right, to give me a snapshot. And so every day I write this, it's like a little ritual, right? You ritualize it in order to embed it as a habit. So I'm up to day 23 and wow, right? <laughs> Um, you know, this is keeping me, this is keeping me on track. And if I look back now, even though I'm still in pain and I'm still out, not out of stage one, which is part of my physio program, I need to get out of stage one, which is pain every day. I'm not out of that. I am so much better. I'm like 90% better than I was three weeks ago when I started this. So what, what this does is even if I'm having a bit of a bad day, I can look back now and I can go, well, you know what? The alkalinity has been going up. The pain's been decreasing. The diet's getting better, like incrementally, yeah? It doesn't, you know, I've, I, know, I know some people can do crash, crash diets, cold turkeys, sudden changing of habits, Um Look, I'm, I don't know if if I would have had the willpower to just do that. I've never been able to fast. You know, there's, there are some things which as a, as, a, as a little Louisa, like the human Louisa, she needs her comforts like coffee, right? I was not willing to give up coffee. I know coffee is really acidic for the body, but I found my way, I found a way to kind of incrementally reduce it. So first I, I cut out all the caffeine in my tea and then I started swapping out um, coffee grounds for dandelion and chicory and mixing it together and now I've got to the point where I can actually have my I call them my half coffees I can actually have two of those a day and still be alkaline as long as I drink tons of green juices and salads right so it's it's a you've got to tinker with it so that 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 part of you that needs comfort that part of you that relies on certain things to feel happy and comfortable still gets some say because if you are very, very harsh with yourself, very, very regimental and punitive and kind of that coffee, what could happen is it can backfire later on, right? You can just, you can have a bad day and you can go, oh, I can't do this anymore. I'm just going to binge on coffee or, you know, and out goes the whole thing. You've blown the whole thing. So <laughs> working your way up so you've got a bit of joy in your life, a bit of comfort, and it's at your own pace. And what starts to happen is you actually start to feel so much better. You start to see the results. And then you, you don't need to use your willpower to override those desires to have the naughty things. You simply want the good things because they're helping you and they're making you feel better. And they're a part of your ultimate goal of healing yourself, right? So there's those sorts of intricacies that you're working with on this healing journey. But if I can really sum them up, and this is the point of the whole video and hopefully what I'll put in the title, is that I've realized as I've been doing this, this 23 days now of, of very, very dedicated attention to my health, that it is ultimately a most beautiful, beautiful act 
of devotion to my body. So to be giving myself this kind of love, this kind of hourly attention, and that's one of the things, one of the reasons I think this physio program is so good because it forces you to give yourself hourly attention to your body. And, you know, if you did, if you just did that at the morning and nighttime, it's probably not enough to override the other activities that are causing you pain during the day. And it's the same with mental health. If you just wake up in the morning and you do a quick meditation and you say, I love myself, and then you do it again at night and you say, I love myself. But the rest of the day, you are basically beating yourself up for being a failure and you're not taking care of yourself and yeah then those couple of times when you when you gave yourself some love they don't have the power to outweigh all that negativity so by making it hourly by making it constant you are going to train yourself and switch focus from the negativity to the positive positivity or in a physical case from the stressor to the relief because that's really what what we're doing here physical it's some kind of painful pain and then pain and relief that's what you're looking at you're looking to decrease the pain and give yourself more relief and with the mental you're looking to switch out negative for positive which is also pain and relief okay it's just different realms we're just walking with working with the physical or the mental emotional but it's the same principle exactly the same principle so those hourly devotions, that's what they are. They're like, a, you know, when, when people are going on pilgrimages or offering themselves in a religious sense to, to God or devoted in some way and nuns, monks, that kind of thing, act of devotion. That's why I really love that word. I just thought it, it brings in the sacredness of what you are actually doing. You know, and when, and, and this, is, this is what you need when you're in acute phase of illness. You can ease off as you get better and better and you can start focusing on other things. But when you're in the acute phase, devotion is what's needed. You know, when someone is really sick and they go to a hospital, there is a level of devotion that is healing in and and of itself because the nurses are always checking on you. There's always something going on that's related to your body, to supporting you, to helping you. And I can argue that some of those things are iatrogenically wounding. In other words, painkillers and some surgeries and some of those things, actually, they tend to kind of deal with the symptom and the over the obvious problem, but not the causes. But without going down that rabbit hole, I still mean to say that, you know, being in a hospital, getting that attention or a clinic, like a healing clinic, when you go and do a, a healing retreat, and your diet is constantly looked after. And so you're focusing fully on it. That's what it takes. You know, you can do this at home by yourself as long as you say to yourself, my priority right now is my body or my priority right now is my mind, and I'm going to focus wholly and solely on it with the same love and devotion that I would give to my partner or my children when they're sick. For all the parents out there, think about that. When you have a sick child, you are devoted to that child. Every little whimper and moan, you come running. What do you need? How can I help you? You get the chicken soup and the the cool towels on the forehead. All of that, right? You're doing that for yourself when you are self-healing. You are devoted, you are loving. Every time your body aches, you say to yourself, what can I do for you, beloved? How can I relieve you of this right now? You know, and that might that will mean a myriad things for everybody, taking time off work or not doing some of the activities that you want to do. But it seems like a sacrifice, but it's only in the short term. It's to get you through the acute phase of illness. It's the same with mental health. What can I do to relieve this pain? How can I help you right now? Is it talking to a loving friend? Is it watching something nice and soothing on YouTube or Netflix or whatever? Right. But in balance, in temperance, because only we know when watching Netflix is therapeutic and watching Netflix is 
taking us down into a dark place and making us feel yuck. You're always looking for relief. So perhaps the formula could be something like acting devotedly in order to create relief for my body. And this is about being in loving relationship to your body. It's very humbling. I have found this last three weeks very humbling because I've had to set aside the normal Louisa priorities, going out with friends or attending to some work, going gardening. I can't garden right now. It's like every time I try and lean over something, I twist my hip and it's really bad for it. Can't walk very far, you know, lots of sitting down, but a lot of movement as well, doing my exercises. So I'm having to sacrifice some things, but it's in service, right? The, the body is a part of me and the body needs me. Every cry of pain is your body saying, I need you, I need help. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very much expecting that some people will watch this video and it will bring up frustration for them or... Uh, self-pity or anger even because you might have been operating with an acute condition for a long, long time or acute or chronic and you feel like you've tried everything and you feel like you have been devoted to your body and maybe you're watching this video going, well, you know, Louisa, you've had this hip pain for six weeks and, you know, what do you know about pain? <laughs> You know, and I want to, I want to like acknowledge and honor that I don't know what it is like to live with chronic pain for years and years. I don't know that. But I do know what it's like to live with chronic mental health pain for years and years. And I do know that spirit often teaches me about the cross correlations of different things, how we can use one experience as a reference point for another. And that's all, that's what helps us empathize and help each other as well. I haven't had all your experiences, but I do know that healing from schizophrenia took the same devotion that healing my hip is taking. Total devotion, love, self-love, creating a container of healing for myself. It's an attitude, it's an energy, and getting help from those, you know, that that can help me. There is a Another component too, and it's it's belief, and I'm I'm going to address that in a different video um, because I want to share a lot of practical kind of stories and metaphors to help you guys with that. But belief is important, and if you do find that you've been very stuck with moving through your chronic illness um, and having any kind of results, then perhaps belief might be the thing for you right? You have the keys to your own healing and you have to find them yourself. But the beauty of these sorts of teachings that are abounding all over the internet is that, you know, we can share ideas, we can motivate each other. And sure enough, you know, a lot of what I'm saying, I learned from, from other people giving testimony online and, and sharing their experiences. So, you know, a big thank you, a deep, deep heartfelt gratitude to the sharing of lived experience to the collective healing that we're all doing. And no matter where you are on that journey, never ever shame yourself for how far you've come. The shame or how far you haven't come in your head, the shame feeds into the fear stories and the guilt and the fear. And um, this is not where you want to focus your attention. Focus on healing. You can do it. Okay. I'll leave it there and I hope to see you in my next video about beliefs and healing. With much love, namaste. Namaste.